Good morning and welcome to the second installment of Spartan Step Up, CWRU, Community Response to COVID-19. This series is coordinated and produced by the Alumni Association of Case Western Reserve University to share information on the efforts we're making related to COVID-19 across the university's many disciplines. I'm Scott Fine, Professor of Banking and Finance at Weatherhead School of Management. And joining me today uh, are a number of folks, including my colleague David, Doc, including my colleague Dr. David Klingysmith, Associate Professor of Economics, and um, also uh, alumnus Andrew Medvedev, Managing Director at Morgan Stanley in New York City. Thank you to both of you for participating in our discussion today. I invite you, our viewers, to submit questions using the chat feature on the live stream uh, feed, or if you're viewing through Facebook Live via the comments section. Let me first turn to Dr. Klinging Smith and ask him a question about the current economic crisis. Uh, Dr. Klinging Smith, how would you contrast our current economic environment to past crises, including the Spanish flu, the Great Depression, and in particular, uh, the post-World War II recessions. And if you could, in addition, talk about what you think the shape of the recovery might be, whether it be V-shaped, U-shaped, W-shaped, L-shaped, or any other letter in the alphabet. <laughs> well, thanks, uh, thanks very much uh, for inviting me to be part of this conversation. And I hope everyone uh, listening today is in good health. Uh, so I'll start first with those letters, uh, V, U, W, and L, that economists use as a shorthand to talk about recessions. So imagine that you're looking at a line graph that shows the level of GDP uh, or economic output over time. Uh, and so as time goes on, GDP tends to increase become, because we become more productive at making things. So this is a graph that goes up from left to right. Uh, so during a recession, GDP falls. And then after some time, when the recession is over, it resumes an upward trajectory. Uh, and so those letters, V, U, L, and W, that economists use refer roughly to the possible paths that output might take during the recession and recovery. Uh, and so it's important also to, uh, to uh, remember that when uh, GDP falls, unemployment rises, and unemployment's probably the worst uh, effect of a recession. Uh, so a V-shaped recession f refers to a sharp fall and then sharp rise in output, like the shape of a V, uh, such that output quickly returns to where it would have been without a recession and unemployment uh, sort of goes up and down very rapidly. A uh, U-shaped recession has more gradual fall and rise, meaning it lasts longer than a V-shaped one. Uh, and an L-shaped one describes a sort of even longer and more sustained fall in output. Uh, a W is just two V-shaped recessions back to back, so where you get a bit of a recovery and then a, another downturn. Um, and so the Great Depression uh, in the 1930s was an L-shaped recession, very prolonged. Uh, since the Second World War, we've had 11 recessions. Uh, the first eight of those were V-shaped and the last three were U-shaped. So we're kind of in, a, in an era when we see a lot of U-shaped recessions. Uh, and so the debate among economists at the moment is mainly about whether we're going to see a U or an L-shaped recession at this time. Uh, for most of us, although not all, a rapid recovery uh, to where we were in January isn't on the table. Um, that isn't to say, however, that we won't see some rapid increase in unemployment, a partial recovery as the lockdowns end. It's just unlikely that we'll get completely back to where we were. Uh, and I'll say a little bit about that uh, by drawing in some historical context. Uh, so economic crises of the kind we're experiencing here with COVID-19 are quite rare. And that's why it's really helpful to look at historical examples to help understand them. Uh, so the flu pandemic of 18 to 19, also known as the Spanish flu, is maybe the closest analog to what we find ourselves in. Uh, that killed about half a percent of the U.S. population, which would be in today's terms about 1.7 million people. And it came in three waves lasting about 18 months. Uh, so like the Spanish flu, the coronavirus is novel, meaning it hasn't infected humans before and as yet we have no good treatments or vaccines. Uh, then, as now, our most powerful measure against it is social distancing. Um, and so the most important thing I think we can take away from the Spanish flu is that it spread until a substantial share of the population is infe was infected. Uh, 
And so we should expect the coronavirus to cause us problems, you know, for a, a similarly long period of time. Um, now, unlike um, the 1918 pandemic, the kinds of social distancing measures we've taken today have been very widespread and extensive. And that's led to a very rapid rise in unemployment, in fact, much more rapid than occurred during the Great Depression. So it took about two years for unemployment to rise to 25% uh, during the Depression, whereas we've kind of come most of the way to that in a couple of months. But we've done it in a very different way by government orders rather than by, uh, by the demand for goods and services falling. And so when those orders expi expire, we could expect to see a rapid rebound. The key thing to keep in mind is that's unlikely to be a complete rebound, and that's because the virus is still with us. And the virus is creating an enormous amount of uncertainty about how safe it is to be out in public, especially for older people and those with com comorbidities. And that's a significant share of the US population uh, and also a group that tends to have a lot of disposable income. So just like the early years of the Great Depression, this is a time of great uncertainty. And uh, we know much less right now about what the future is likely to bring than usual. And I think that's really important to keep in mind during the coming months. Uh, in the Depression, the uncertainty resulted because the economy failed to rebound after the <coughs> recession started. And at the time, no one was sure why it was so persistent. And there was no clear sense of what circumstances would be soon. Uh, in, either in six months or a couple of years. And so when people are uncertain, they tend to hold back on their economic activity. And that may be good for, from an individual perspective, but bad uh, from a, a kind of overall perspective, because when people hold back on consumption, uh, that's a, a drag on the economy. Um, and so I have a few other sort of few other thoughts on the depression there that maybe we can uh, that maybe we can come back to, but that's my sort of, that's my kind of basic take. Okay, well, thank you. That's a good comprehensive start to our conversation. Mr. Medvedev, there's a bit of a contrast between uh, the picture that Dr. Klingensmith just painted and really what's going on on Wall Street and in the securities markets. Public equity markets fell quite considerably, uh, and they've now, I wouldn't say largely recovered, but they certainly recovered quite substantially, as have the bond markets. How do you contrast what we see <clears throat> on Main Street and in the economy to what's going on in the securities markets? Well, uh, thank you, Professor Fine, and uh, it's good to be with you all this morning. I think this is a fascinating question, and it's a super important question, so uh, I think the best I can do is offer my own perspective on this. Um, probably the first thing to keep in mind is that the markets are not the economy, right? They're comprised of very different actors, incentives, time horizons. So, for example, take the S&P 500, which, by the way, has been a bit of an outlier among many markets. The S&P 500 is 500 largest listed companies in the U.S. So some of the best equipped uh, entities to deal with uh, economic impacts, they have access to financing, they have some best market share in their industries. Um, and so they're much more likely to persevere through this downturn than an average real economy system. The inequality topic that we talk a lot about in social matters is also a function of markets. There's great inequality within companies that are rising inequality within S&P 500, where the largest entities have had the best margins, the best resilience, and have separated themselves uh, from the rest of the field, why that's a topic probably for a whole other webcast, but uh, the fact remains that, for example, close to 20% of S&P 500 is five companies, right? Uh, the internet giants that we all know and talk about. And, and query whether that composition effect is affecting how the aggregate performs. There's a lot of actors within the S&P 500 that are not doing so. But markets are ultimately discounting them, right? Meaning that they look and the future set of cash flows that come from the companies and say, what's the likely outcome of these cash uh, uh, for the next several uh, years and, and decades? And then what's the rate at which I'm willing to discount those cash flows back to today? If you posit that the markets will look for a, a company with an average life of decades, even if you have a complete wipeout for a year or two, provided that company can stay in business, the impact to the 
lifetime expected earnings of that company is not that large. Couple that with very large fall in interest rates, which is what probably affects at the rate at which you're willing to bring those cash flows forward, discount in other words, that even further reduces the impact on value of securities today. So the markets are saying, my, my discount rate has just gone down. Whether this is a one or two year event, eventually we're gonna get back to normal. As long as I can make it through the next couple of years, things are gonna be okay. And the, as long as I can make it through is a critical point here because supporting all of this, and I hate to use that word, but unprecedented, uh, probably an overused term last few months, level of stimulus from the Fed. Yes, the real economy has received stimulus that's uh, multiples larger than what's been produced in the GFC over a much longer period of time. But if you look at what the Federal Reserve is doing, it's, it's unprecedented. Fed is now supporting corporate bond market. Fed is actively supporting junk bond issuers, right? This is something that has been tried in only a few other markets by a few other central banks, but never really in the US and on a scale we're talking about. So not only is the real economy in a different spot in the markets, US, but also there's an express support crisis that is being provided by an actor of effectively unlimited pockets. But I think it, if, it's important to remember that the S&P 500 is an outlier. Many other markets around the world have not recovered nearly as much. And that's perhaps a faith in, the, in American ingenuity, American uh, public sector support, or the prevalence of the companies that, that uh, people may think will win uh, in the new world future uh, in S&P 500, such as Facebook's and Amazon's versus uh, the, the uh, companies that comprise other industries all around the world. Well, thank you. Let's uh, turn now to questions from our viewers. Let me remind you that if you would like to submit questions, you can either use the chat feature on live stream or if you're viewing via Facebook Live via the comments section. Um, let me start, Dr. Klingensmith, with a question um, you know, to you, which really has to do with the disconnect between the securities markets and, again, you know, unemployment, um, uh, inequality, um, the, the, uh, the, the drop in household income. How do, you, how do you personally square those things up? So I, I guess I, you know, I, I think that uh, the things that Andrew said were quite, uh, were quite illuminating. Uh, particularly the, uh, I guess, two things, uh, the, the, the um, sort of unprecedented action by the Fed to provide uh, financing to all kinds of entities in the economy, including those that it uh, hasn't funded before. And so I think that that gives many people, um, and particularly these large firms that are really able to take advantage of, of of the availability of that kind of liquidity, a, a better bridge to the future than than others uh, others may have, um, and that was also something you know that we saw in the two thousand nine recession that the the you know the stock market rebounded much more quickly than uh, than employment did. So the unemployment recession was very long. Uh, the downturn in the uh, in the sort of uh, securities markets was 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 much shorter um another thing that i sort of was thinking about as andrew was was speaking was uh and that he uh, sort of alluded to at the end was the role of the us as a kind of uh haven during uh financial turmoil so this is a global crisis and people who uh, have assets in other markets in emerging markets that may be less um able to uh, to sort of fight the pandemic with policy, uh, maybe seeing you know the U.S. is a very attractive place to put assets, and they also are, and they also are looking for uh, some returns, and so the U.S. equities markets may be very attractive to them. Um, I personally wonder whether you know is this a is this the sort of is this a sort of stable and, and permanent rebound in securities prices or, or is there a degree to which we haven't yet sort of built in fully 
the possibilities or the likelihood of what's going to happen over the next few months? So that's a very good question. That's a good segue to a question we got from Jacob via live stream. And uh, Jacob was asking about the second wave impacts as we see uh, the impact of the economic crisis on municipalities and other government entities in terms of tax receipts, um, some industries like higher ed uh, that are probably regrettably long overdue um, for um, a day of reckoning, and this has accelerated that. And we can ripple down to the restaurant industry, the travel industry, et cetera. So um, probably also can, you know, uh, probably also extend that to commercial real estate where we've seen migrations of people temporarily out of major metropolitan areas like New York City and some people question whether that's going to be permanent. So Mr. Medvedev, let me start with you. You live in New York. Uh, you are sequestering in rural New Jersey. Um, what are your reflections on uh, the issues that are raised by Jacob in the live stream question? Uh, I think it's an excellent question and the one that we're all grappling with every day. And in the past and like, um, it seems to, from looking at securities markets, that the marginal market is pricing in uh, a gradual but a one-way recovery in the sense that a W scenario. Part of the reason is that the support mechanisms that we have in place don't seem to have bandwidth to sustain the economy through another leg down. And, and, you know, it's not even a, a similar size, that's longer one. So then the question becomes uh, what happens then and there? It, it's part of it is going to be to what extent do we believe that the Fed's arsenal? A lot of the discussion over the prior several years has been. Boy, we're really afraid of the next recession, not because of how bad it's going to be, but because the Fed is out of ammunition. Well, uh, I think the Fed has definitively proved that they're not out of ammunition today. The question is, do we want to bet against them going forward, or will they resort to extraordinary support, um, effectively provide the cushion on an unlimited basis, regardless of possibly? Um, I, in terms of the impact of the real economy, I think the critical questions are going to be, what extent want to extrapolate today's trends in the future versus think about a, a micro level of how the economy will be reworked, what the knock-on effects will be of that. So whether we have an L-shaped, W-shaped, or U-shaped recovery, changes that we're seeing in the fabric of how we do business have already started and are unlikely to go away. Thank you. Dr. Klingensmith, would you add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, so in terms of, like, in t I think that there's, a, it's unclear to me how much of the changes that have been sort of set in motion as a result of this, uh, of the pandemic are going to sort of be with us and how many of them are going to, uh, are going to, are going to sort of go away because a lot of the, uh, you, we've sort of forced people to behave differently and the virus is forcing people to behave differently, to not go to restaurants, to kind of change their consumption patterns. And it's not clear to me yet uh, whether, you know, those are going to be permanent changes or whether people are going to, once the opportunity arises, going to want to kind of go back to their uh, old way of life. So, I mean, it, we could see something like, uh, just to sort of give an example where we see a big rise in in sort of takeout and delivery type restaurants that last for a couple of years, uh, you know, people build up that capacity. Uh, but then we don't really know whether people are going to continue to want to sort of, you know, spend their money on eating out in that way or whether they're going to want to go back to uh, to in-person restaurants again. So preferences may change. I mean, we may sort of become permanently different people. And I think that we all, you know, in experiencing several months of being mainly inside, have felt that for ourselves, that we have changed in ways that maybe we don't think are going to, uh, are, are, we're going to go back. Um, but, uh, you know, when we kind of release the constraints that are imposed on us, it's not clear to me what, what's going to happen. Well, so there are a number of questions via live stream from Heather, Eli, and Lou really relating 
to um, both monetary policies as well as stimulus packages. Um, what do both of you think um, are left in the arsenal for the Fed and for other branches of the government? Uh, and what do you think the impact will be? Let me start with you, Dr. Klinging Smith. Uh, so I think that the the possibilities for um, for fiscal for fiscal policy, so for the government to engage in direct spending to uh, to fight the pandemic, are quite substantial in theory. Um, you know, uh, and I, I sort of turn to the um, example of World War II whenever I think about this. So we spent about seventy five percent of GDP to fight World War II. That would be about $15 trillion in today's money. Uh, we've spent about $2 trillion so far on the pandemic. Uh, and there's a question, sort of there's political debate about how much more we do. Uh, but I think it's important to remember that uh, in the years after World War II, you know, we, we sort of we raised a lot of debt. But that debt wasn't a sort of albatross around our necks during the 50s and 60s. And that's because we had very robust economic growth, lots of new productivity in those decades. Uh, and we essentially grew ourselves out of that debt. So I think that there's the potential to do a lot and that we could, whether, we, whether there's the political will to do it is another, is another question. Uh, and that I'm, that's the thing I'm unsure about. And how much of this is a relative game versus an absolute game? And what I mean by that, what the U.S. is doing versus uh, other nations in other central banks. So so re relative versus what the, what the U.S. is doing in particular versus what they're doing relative to other nations. I guess I think of it, and maybe uh, I think of it as mainly a kind of absolute, um, an absolute, an absolute game. Um, I, you know, may, the, with, where the Fed may be the exception to that, but at least in terms of the um, the fiscal policy response, I think that that's mainly a, a sort of domestic question. I mean, there are international, you know, international effects of. The willingness of the Fed to uh, extend so much uh, cheap credit, and people can, you know, move their move their assets over here if they if they if they feel like um, the support, uh, you know, support for the U.S. economy is very strong. So there's a, a sense in which that's a that's a relative game. Uh, I, I don't know whether that's something Andrew would sort of agree with, or whether he he sort of has a different take on that than I do. Uh, I I think that's exactly right. Uh, I the U.S. has been very different and proved to be very different over the last 10 years. I just think this is what um, U.S. is, number one, a very much more of a closed economy than uh, most economies around the world because of our sheer size. We care a lot less about what happens to countries elsewhere. If country X does not want to buy our imports or country Y wants to ban flights from the U.S., it's much less of a big deal to the U.S. than to Germany. Uh, at the same time, the U.S. has shown that because of its single coordination ability at the federal level, for all of the of our potential institutional shortcomings, we're still able to exert policy quicker and more forcefully than other large blocks like Europe. And so, the typical solution from history, I understand, and Dr. Clinton's correct me on this, is that when when uh, push comes to shove, these types of events are usually resolved through money and inflating away uh, the consequences. Uh, the political pain of imposing uh, either higher taxation or defaults is generally not based. The ability of the Fed to play a much larger role in the solution here in the U.S. I think creates a better pathway towards that type of a solution, similar to what uh, has happened in the, in the, in the, in the 70s when inflation played a much larger part of the burden from prior uh, debt accumulation. Thank you. Mr. Medvedev, if I could ask you maybe to swap out your uh, speaker for uh, another headset because we're having some choppiness in your audio, that would be great. While you do that, let me turn to uh, Dr. Klingley Smith and ask um, a couple of questions that are coming from the live stream. It really has to do with um, the impact of some of the monetary policy. Um, what are your thoughts on the long-term debt levels uh, and potential problems that may uh, uh, pose to our uh, country and our economy going forward, and also what the impact of 
what central bank movements, not only in the U.S., but also around the world, have on inflation and whether we should be concerned about that in the intermediate term. So I think I think that um, the the sort of first point there about debt levels, I don't think that we have a that we in the United States have a, a, a great deal to worry about in terms of the the sort of amount that we might borrow, the degree to which we we might increase the sort of ratio of debt uh, to GDP. Uh, you know, we still have um, you know we're still sort of the one of the key reserve currencies in the world. We have a, a, sort, a sort of lot of deep economic strength and people are going to, you know, want to buy our assets. Uh, we have, um, you know, we have a, a you know, a stellar reputation in terms of, uh, in, you know, in terms of never having defaulted before. So I think that we could take on quite a lot of debt uh, and still, um, you know, even though there's the sort of question about interest payments, and that's always a bit of, a, you know, that's always a drag. We're not in the the sort of dire or potentially dire circumstances that a country like Italy might be uh, might be facing. Um, in inflation, I'm not particularly, you know, I'm not particularly worried about um, yet. I, I sort of am always, I guess, more. Uh, more worried about deflation than inflation because deflation tends to have a lot of pernicious and uh, reinforcing effects. You know, I think that if we get a little bit more inflation than we had before, it actually would be a good thing. I think that, you know, having uh, 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 inflation a bit higher and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, this is sort of a medium to long term thing, having interest rates be a bit higher than they are now. Uh, which gives the Fed a bit more room to maneuver when it comes uh, when it comes to downturns could be you know could be a good thing um, over the longer term. So I'm not worried about inflation. Okay, let, let me turn to a question that uh, somebody loves our university so much they actually show up as Sparty. I don't know if that's their, <laughs> that's their legal name or not, but Sparty asks. Um, okay, Sparty. Really, a question around the. Um, government bailing out particular businesses and industries and really whether there's, I think, a notion of fairness that Boeing and the airlines are getting a bailout package while many other parts of the economy, even big companies like Hertz, JCPenney, et cetera, are uh, filing for bankruptcy and potentially going out of business. Mr. Medvedev, let me uh, start with you. Do you have a, a view on the fairness of that and uh, how you feel about that? Uh, I'd probably say three things. Uh, first of all, fairness is in the eye of the beholder, and uh, I, I'm certainly not in any position to comment uh, on what may be perceived as fair as unfair. It's, we all have our own views, and I think all different. Right there. Um, I think the second thing is that fairness, to me, uh, should not take a front seat to systemic rescues and the ability of the economy to go on. It's something that should be addressed post facto once we feel like is back in order, uh, and there's and there's an opportunity to sort this out. And, uh, I'm afraid that a lot of times concerns around fairness has stopped the initial action that probably would uh, would have resulted in a much greater social good uh, had we uh, uh, subordinated those concerns to those of, of um, returning the economy. Not to say that they're not important; it's just a question of what this is. Third thing I'd say is that. Uh, Bankruptcy is a scary word, but bankruptcy is just another word for reorganizing claims holders on the company. Right? Company doesn't, the, the, certainly in the US, that has a very advanced bankruptcy architecture, just not to go anywhere. The question is going to be how are the stakeholders across the economy affected back to the initial discussion of markets versus the economy? What happens to the employees? What happens to the customers? What happens to the contracts? What happens to the suppliers? Bondholders, right? Stockholders are only one, sometimes probably uh, uh, one of the smaller groups of constituents around that company. So in some sense, if one group of investors gets bailed out and the other one does not, it's a relatively uh, smaller part of the overall picture that involves all of these other constituencies. And if that allows the rest of uh, the stakeholders in the enterprise to go on, again, that's in part why 
uh, the notion of can we keep moving and keep I from disappearing is more important today than how do we divide up that time. So that's a very good question. Let me um, uh, segue into a question for Dr. Klingingsmith, really related to um, those in their 20s and maybe early 30s. That could be some of our younger alums or, frankly, the kids of many of our alums. Um, mm-hmm. That generation already had uh, a lot of debt, particularly student debt, um, and many of uh, the folks in that generation were in the gig economy and are now um, facing um, perhaps bigger hurdles than other folks in the economy. What would you say and what do you want to say about the prospects uh, for folks in that demographic? I think it's a very challenging time uh, for for that group. Um, I it, more I think even more so for people who are just entering the labor market uh, right now. So those who are who have been uh, been out for a while, um, you know, have sort of made some steps along their career path, may be uh, sort of less seriously affected than those who are. Um, who are just coming out. Uh, I think that it's probably true that, uh, you know, Case as a, um, you know, as an, an elite institution with, you know, super talented students, I think that our, uh, you know, people who are, who are Case graduates or current Case students don't face the same um, degree of, hardship that those who, uh, you, you know, who aren't so fortunate are going to face. Um, I, you know, I think that there's there's been a fair bit of research recently showing that the, for people who graduate in a, in a labor market that is, that's poor, um, that there are long-term effects of that, um, that career paths are, are, are sort of poorer earnings over a long period of time or lower uh, catch up for many people doesn't happen. Um, I would say that I, I think that um, one thing that I could sort of offer maybe is a piece of advice that comes out of some of that is <clears> that <throat> um, catch up often happens by people uh, sort of rapidly upgrading the jobs that they have once economic conditions get better. So, you know, you may have to accept a, a, a sort of position that's not as good as the one you would have wanted when you first get out of school. But if you're a highly talented person, you're likely to be able to upgrade as the economy improves. Uh, and so, you, sh- you know, people should keep a lookout for those opportunities and not be afraid to take them uh, when they come up. Let, they let, me, will. let me ask a, perhaps a final question. That's a tough one. It really bookends uh, the first um, discussion that was led by Dr. Stan Gerson uh, in a panel of health experts. I mean, this is a pretty unique situation. I think, as you said, Dr. Klingensmith, really uh, unprecedented in terms of almost over 100 years since we've had an economic crisis really driven by a, uh, by a global health crisis. So there are a lot of questions about what your views, uh, the two of you are on, um, should we open back up the economy by people going to work versus continuing stay at home? Um, what the role of testing is in all of that? And it's a pretty polarizing issue if you pay attention to anything that is in the popular press or, press or even pay attention to what people chose to do over the memorial day weekend. So, Mr. Medvedev, I'll start with you and um, see what your reflections are. And then, Dr. Kling smith I'll ask you. I, I think it's an incredibly difficult question, uh, and I, I will largely fund uh, all panelists. I, I think what we need is a much more granular and a much more cross-regional look at what we know. I'd love to see more of a discussion of how various um, approaches have worked or not worked decisions on now. Uh, I think we see a lot of tribal sorting uh, by the, uh, along the usual lines and not enough discussion uh, of what has worked what hasn't. We have an incredible opportunity to observe hundreds of natural experiments in applying different pathways to addressing this challenge, and which should result in long-term uh, accretion to productivity, to innovation and such, just out of this one tragedy. 
but I'd love to see I'd love to see that taken forward. I'd love to see localized content and localized considerations uh, take precedence over perhaps supranational discussions. I think we'll see some sectors open up first. I think we'll see uh, a novel approach to doing business within other sectors. Um, and I do think that the economy of 2023 will, on an aggregate basis, look similar to that of 2019. But within that aggregation, you're going to see a lot of shifts in terms of which sectors have done well, which haven't. And, um, and that can only really, but we, really, we, we can really only get to that promised land if we, if we start that experimentation and context driven analysis today. Thank you. Dr. Klingy Smith? Yeah, I, can, I completely agree with the idea that. We, we we need to sort of foreground and not lose track of the fact that we do not know very much about the virus yet or about what the effectiveness of different measures to combat it are. And we have to keep learning uh, and keep looking for um, the evidence that the different sort of experiences and experiments in different locations uh, uh, can, can give us uh, and to sort of try and design approaches that um, that draw on that experience. I think we also need to keep in mind, and this is something that really for the first month or so, maybe six weeks of the pandemic, uh, a lot of us had this idea of vaccine in 12 to 18 months in the back of our minds. I think, you know, uh, it's a, a sort of optimistic number that was, you know, promoted by Dr. Fauci. And something that we, I think, ha have hung a lot of um, hope on. But we need to realize that that is, you know, th that's by no means a guarantee uh, that we'll get a vaccine in 18 months or in four years or even ever. Uh, and so to think that we can just wait um, and uh, not sort of experiment and try to see what we can do to live with the virus is a, is a mistake. Um, by the same token, we need to keep in, also keep in mind that the risks that are posed to people seem to vary a lot by age and by comorbidities, and that uh, there's a danger in pushing people back into work because of financial pressures who, uh, who may be for, that people who may be forced to take risks that they are not comfortable with uh, and or that are that are just, you know, outsized for them. Uh, and we need to think about ways to to sort of provide opportunities for people to keep themselves safe uh, while still, you know, being able to eat and keep body and soul together and that sort of thing. Uh, I think it's an extremely complicated challenge and one that, you know, will take um, a tremendous amount of 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 of, of intellectual uh, effort and experience to 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 push forward with. Well, thank you. I want to thank both of you, Doc, uh, Dr. Klinging Smith and Mr. Medvedev, for offering your insights into the economic challenges related to COVID nineteen. We could go on for all morning and probably for a few days on <laughs> this topic. Uh, we will have the third installment of Spartan Step Up. Uh, it's slated for Tuesday, June 2nd at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The university's provost, Dr. Ben Vinson III, will moderate a discussion that's focused on teaching and learning in a remote world. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, all of us wish you good health.